All held the finite and the infinite unrelated. None could foresee that the history of the two would become one. There's a notably melancholic tone to the new briefing screen music. At around this point in Ace Combat 4, the music had picked up in pace and the war had began to turn around. You began to invade enemy territory. From here, your missions become more cloak and dagger. The sting of Pixie's betrayal calls for a theme this downhearted. The song does pick up into a more typically upbeat and heroic theme, but only about 50 seconds in. The direction of the music in this game is superb. One of the first things of note is the choice of exotic instrumentation. The synths used in tracks like the Briefing Screens, Excalibur, Milan Results have a more retro feel to them being so obviously synthetic. But they sound unlike any typical synth I've ever heard. In my mind, it almost felt like these would be this world's variant of synth tracks, because they sound so foreign. Another example of the instrumentation style is the use of high-tempo Spanish guitar, calling to mind tango, flamenco, bullfighting, during major battles, mostly around the B7R airspace. Now this is brilliant. All three of these are a type of dance, if you could call bullfighting a type of unwilling duet. It can be placed as a visual metaphor for air-to-air -air combat. For instance, traditionally bullfighting is where one or several matadors take turns misdirecting a bull using red capes before stabbing it in the back. Similarly, flamenco is a lone dance, where one person takes center stage, perhaps the inverse of the bullfighting metaphor, which both bring to mind the garm versus many battles the player can face. Tangos are duets, where one dancer follows the other's lead, which brings to mind the dynamic between garm team. It's not just the choice of instrumentation, however. There's a more solid consideration of several motifs. There's several reoccurring themes rather than just a single one or two for Ace Combat 4. used over and over in different contexts. These examples also extend into trills, samples and little bridges in the tracks that give the soundtrack a more unifying feel, despite the extremely broad range of genres and purposes. But mine and everybody's favourite example is the primary motif. Previously, in the opening cutscene and in Tia Passion, the instrumentation had been so strong, with the brass sections and the string sections working in unison to iron our melody, with complementary backing chords and flourishes, one might even say like Pixie and Cypher had been. Now, during the sortie screen, the same brass melody is kept, but to a harsher electric guitar rather than complementing, it adds a controversial layer, assisted by some electric bass. The main motif doesn't ever play itself out in all of its splendor again. There's something which Pixie brought thematically, which is missing in this track and there's something replacing it very poorly. That something is PJ, your brand new wingman. As if things couldn't get any more dire. It's not that the kid is particularly bad at being a wingman, but Pixie's strong and stylish character quirks. Always calling your buddy, asking if you were still alive, his snark. It's a difficult act to follow. The game knows this, and it makes absolutely no effort to warm the player to PJ. His formality upon being paired with you just heightens the differences. He even tells you his real name over radio and his favorite sports. He's pathetic. And then, after an awkward pause, he has to go and bring up Pixie. I don't know if it was a worthwhile sacrifice, but in order to twist the knife of Pixie's betrayal, PJ is so intentionally annoying here. Bravo to the writing team. It's worthy of note that he doesn't seem to be aware that Pixie opened fire at Cypher, though. Perhaps another small piece of characterization for Cypher is that he never told anyone. In a way, that makes it even sadder. The Stealth Jets at this point have become a reoccurring enemy, which is fine because they had a little bit of difficulty and some opportunity for your wingman to shine. Though the fights can get a little bit annoying. And these are going to be the fights you're seeking if you ever decide to fight aiming for night style. During some missions, particularly this one, there's simply not enough targets on the ground to hit the point threshold without scouring the skies for more planes to clean up. The yellow targets that you're so chivalrous to not destroy start to feel like they're mocking you for your dedication. It's never a game-ending problem, and there are plenty of targets, it's just a mild annoyance sometimes. This mission exists to establish a new state of play. There are Belkans who refuse the ceasefire order and aren't surrendering. Whilst doing this, it gets away with a direct reference and a reuse to an entire Ace Combat 5 map. This isn't the first or last time the game does this, and even amongst the original maps, B7R is revisited several times itself. 
They play this weakness off as an integral part of the mythos of the story, but it still means the game is lacking in scenery changes. Including a meaningless callback like this doesn't help the case, when reviews of the game joked that Ace Combat Zero was an expansion pack of five. It's more than made up for with a huge amount of replayability with variable content. But this also means that in order for you to get all three variations of the cutscenes, you'll be revisiting B7R at least nine times if you're efficient. Mission 14, the final overture. More dirty work. The reason why Cypher is likely so hard to track down after the war, as the interviewer said, is because all these remaining missions are black ops. Using mercenary planes is a good way to avoid the messy paperwork that comes with attacking a military base, even if that military base is trying to protest an official capitulation by the temporary Belkan government through offensive action. The scale of their action is enough to warrant another three-prong optional mission, but there's no interesting optional stories this time. Apparently the enemy forces have become almost insane with their fear of Cypher. The Demon Lord supposedly caused all of this. It's easy to take the blame onto yourself if you're that way inclined. Your actions did lead to the circumstances that backed Belker into a corner. But I'm not sure that there's any reasonable circumstance that necessitates auto-nuclear annihilation. For the Flying Run, there's a few of these missions which block the radar locally to a specific plane. And it's a fun inclusion. It's difficult to get a shot off without being in their escort's firing range, so you're more or less pushed towards doing some blind shooting. The bombing run has a ridiculous amount of surface-to-air missiles, and if you're playing as a knight, your spread bomb will be off limits due to how tight the enemy is with the housing estates. Interestingly, even with boats, you can simply take out the armaments to neutralize them. Lastly, the mixed run has you spawn camping runways before they can swarm you in the air. There's an incredible attention to detail in this game, where there were small parts lacking in the previous two games. As the planes take off, they kick into high gear and fly directly upward into the air. Which is awful for fuel mileage, but it's the recommended tactic to avoid enemy fire. It doesn't do them much good here. Likewise for the player, the direct one-to-one -one control of your pitch and roll, like the use of an actual flight stick being mapped to the analog stick, allows you to pull off such real-life maneuvers. While chasing a plane, amateur players will fly directly to the enemy and figure out how to arrive behind them from there. A more experienced player understands the approach is key, and that you needn't chase the enemy so directly, in favour of an approach that falls somewhat short, but that aligns with the enemy's tail. And of course, this is one of the most basic techniques taught to Air Force pilots. Pursuit curves. Aim your nose at where the enemy's headed, and you'll be in a lead pursuit. Good for catching up, but it's likely to be taken advantage of and put you as the pursued. And it's very easy to lose the enemy if they decide to turn suddenly, leaving you taking the lead of nothing. Place your nose to where the enemy was, and you'll have a lag pursuit. One that'll make you relatively slower to them, and more likely to lose them in terms of speed, but one that might actually get you into a prime position to open fire on their tail. You also have an easier time tailing them, if they decide to take a sudden turn. It's not going to be one of these that you use, but many as you try to consider the best approach for each individual enemy. This ridiculously simple, yet accurate enough control scheme also has the side effect of getting the player to use techniques they may have heard of, depending on how much of a plane attack they are, or how many movies and games they've happened to come across with named plane maneuvers. Everyone will try loop-de-loop, -loop, and it may end up becoming the only thing you do when you're overwhelmed and need to do an evasive maneuver. Barrel rolls are terribly disorienting, but allow you to do slow speed approach without slowing your speed. You might figure out you can use gravity to help you speed up faster, or the climbing will help you slow down if you need to put on the brakes. It's confusing, therefore, that there's no tutorial in any of the games to explain basic flight techniques. That's something that, if thought of, might be considered a large fault to many people, because these techniques are primary tools when it comes to playing the game. There's a fully realized tutorial mode in Ace Combat 4 and 5 for the most basic gameplay elements, but nothing on how to use them. There may be a purpose to this, however. Third dimensional movement may be something that you, your friends and I are well accustomed to, having played games all of our lives. But if you ever handed off the controller to an inexperienced loved one, you might have realized exactly how foreign the concept is to the average person. Beyond just controlling, they struggle to understand the limitations and tropes of a typical video game. And you might assume that a tutorial would help them, but Project Aces seem to have taken a different approach. In the days when 3D graphics were first being introduced to home consoles in Japan, there was a large worry of something called 3D sickness. It's difficult to explain, but essentially by handing the camera to the player, particularly using first-person view modes, the disposition between the movement of the camera and the feeling in the body would cause the sickness. This wasn't something that affected scrolling 2D screens, or something that affected 3D games with more cinematic viewports. Imagine the difference between American first-person shooters in the 90s and Japanese JRPGs of the 90s. 
Around the time 3D consoles were first coming on the scene, there was a study that tested three broad races, white, black and Asian, to see if they were more susceptible to motion sickness. Ironically, Asians from the Orient were more likely to be disoriented, followed by Asian Americans. Such cultural evidences like Japanese 3D sickness may further prove this sensitivity. Known suffering game developers include Hideo Kojima and Yoko Taro. Hideo Kojima for the longest time held on to using cinematic viewports, and Yoko Taro's considerations leave menus over encumbered. A link to this study is in the description. Rather than create a tutorial that would risk enforcing discomfort, Project Aces allows the player to avoid it on their own terms, perhaps even to ease themselves into it. Furthermore, this leads me to another thought, Novice Mode. It's a mode of play that's abhorred by the Ace Combat fan community, for oversimplifying the gameplay. The left stick is mapped for horizontal rotation on the x-axis, and pitch for the y-axis, not unlike the 87 arcade game Afterburner. It's responsive, and it's easily understandable, and it does simplify the gameplay. But this is almost assuredly for one single purpose. In novice mode, you cannot roll your plane over. And more importantly, the game camera is vastly more independently stable from the player's inputs. In fact, the entire plane independently stabilizes. By removing one-to-one -one feedback from the player's inputs, there's a buffer in place where you role play as a pilot rather than simulate one. And in that way, as much as the plane will do things out of the player's control, it may well be easier to stomach for a sensitive audience. Back to the original point. Where does a poorly tutorialed game leave it? Well, just like how the life and death of the plane is entirely within your hands, so is the learning process. Most of the fundamental tactics are things you might happen across by accident, or figure out alone. Perhaps you might even put in the time to look up basic flight maneuvers. It's not too dissimilar from how a puzzle game will leave you with the bare elements and expect you to piece them together from essential interactions. I think that what the game gains in accessibility it loses in complexity, but it also heightens the initial experiences of learning to play. As much as it leaves questions in my mind about what could be, I believe it might well be a worthy sacrifice. PJ's desperately confused why so many would still be fighting a war that's practically over, up until the last enemy when he realises that, with this amount of enemies, perhaps the war truly isn't over. It's interesting to see his simplistic viewpoint work, but he's not absolutely naive. He has a little moment where he asks himself how Pixie would have handled this situation. It's another twist of the knife, but it kind of makes you feel sorry for the kid. He's a very capable idiot. Maybe being gone too is more pressure than he's letting on. The big shoes to fill. The game grinds some story out, with a radio broadcast picked up on comms following the proceedings of the official meeting of state leaders in Belka. There's allied tanks on the ground, and the meeting is supposedly going to reduce Belka's military forces and nuclear armaments. The latter of which is something perhaps a little too late at this point. After mission, there's some elaboration on these meetings. Osius meddling has gone perfectly to plan, assumedly. The Balkan War is now restricted to the tabletops of politicians fighting over the natural resources of Ustio, implying it's the only reason they even came to the aid of the small country. There's also visuals detailing movements of borders. Belka is now restricted to not much but North Belka, having been devoured by Osia and Ustio. The country is effectively being neutered, and that's a good enough reason for the military to revolt and begin taking terrorist action six months later. That revolt is known as a world with no boundaries. Earlier I'd asked a rhetorical question. If nationalism, internationalism, amoral individualism and nationless individualism are all shown in such a harsh light, what alternative is there to that? The answer is a loose interpretation of Marxist anarchism, in which nations by default simply don't exist, and are constructs of those in charge. To quote, The communists are further approached with desiring to abolish countries and nationality. The working men have no country. We cannot take from them what they have not. We've just received an emergency transmission from the control tower. Unidentified aircraft are approaching our base. Scramble all planes. Quick, there's no time. Get into the air immediately. The music cuts out for this briefing, and sparse detail is available. It's the introduction of another fantastic set piece where you're trapped in your cockpit, unable to lift off, while this behemoth of a jet flies over from behind, casting a shadow over the entire base. Aside from PJ are the only two able to make it airborne, conveniently, and the next confrontation takes place over the same old familiar castle. This time, it's covered in Christmas snow, with a chunk of Earth eaten out of it by a nuclear blast. This castle is featured once again in Ace Combat 5 late on, where the protagonists of the game vaguely recall the seven nukes. It goes without saying that's a very large piece of lore to drop and not elaborate upon at all. What kind of a war drops seven nukes? But it ended up being a great tease, and the answer exceeded my expectations. The gigantic plane named XB-0 is escorted by a small fleet and a unique set of enemy aces, the Espada team, a male-female duo, 
Espada isn't a German translation for a color for once. It's a Spanish translation for sword. Different countries have different naming conventions for their fleets, and this particular duo come from the country of Sapin, just south of Ustio and an ally during the Balkan War. You can ignore the scenario and open fire immediately at the two, but there's a brief drama where your CEO has to okay it on his own authority. As with the Gelb team, depending on which you take down first, the radio comments change slightly. If you take out a Sparta 1, the male, you'll complain he's slowing down with age, and while a Sparta 2 demands he pull out. If instead you take out a Sparta 2, it's briefly implied she's dead, before a Sparta 1 laments how it's now 1 on 2. One clearly seems to care for the other more, a very unfair relationship. The game's not afraid to give the player one half of a full impression of this during the first playthrough, and in a way that also makes your experience with the game more of a somewhat individual one. Their relationship will be elaborated upon further later. The flying arsenal gear they were defending has three waves. Firstly, a few mounted turrets and a missile defense system to manually take offline. Secondly, some more mounted guns, and then the engines. Lastly, you need to get up ahead of it and swoop back around and fire at its nose. Although the player's likely been doing this the whole game, it acts as a good tutorial for a little bit later. Just like that, the super weapon is once again being introduced and abandoned within the space of one mission. It's another small complaint with the game, but the brisk pacing doesn't leave much time for build-up. And whilst the speed at which the player is receiving story is just staggered enough to make it interesting, nobody's going to remember Excalibur or XB0 in the same way they remember Stonehenge or Megalith. They simply don't hold a large enough place in the moment-to-moment -moment events of the story. They're not given enough elbow room to properly express why they're a threat, as interesting and well-realized as their individual fights are. And like that, Cypher and PJ bag another one. And unfortunately, their achievements this time aren't likely going down in history either. Perhaps they should have just let it go. Last thing the Waldrake Mountains needed was another crater. Just to iron in that tutorial, we get a message from none other than Pixie himself, who's joined a world with no boundaries. The terrorist cell's beliefs may be based on Marxism, but in Japan, Marx's writings are concentrated on for their philosophies outside of his economic and sociological ideals, and more for his existentialist philosophies regarding finding one's value in one's work in particular. Marx's anti-country stance was based on the belief that the worker was being oppressed by the structures of power above him, and that something like a country doesn't really exist once you remove the capital-driven structures. It's difficult to pair Marx's economic beliefs with the beliefs of a world without boundaries. Whilst Pixie's motives, and I suppose the other members' motives, are mostly a reaction to horrors of war and what the far-right government of Belka ended up doing to it, another motivation may well be the competition over the natural resources and how Ustio is effectively paid for its army. Or perhaps the inference of a very rich war economy in Strange Real. Mission 16. The final play of the game is a large three-mission stretch where you won't be able to change a plane, broken up by short briefings and refueling segments. We're taking ourselves one last time, night time, back to B7R, and we get a brief mention of one final super weapon, V2. A nuclear weapon platform that threatens the entire world by bombing multiple targets at once, though who knows who the target is for this renegade group. Since the first place we're going is B7R, the game's encouraging the player to use their knowledge of what that stage is usually used for, and pick a jet that can fight. At last, the main motif is back in full force, with the string and brass back together for this one last briefing. Perfectly timed to break down into some gritty synth while you review what little there is to review about the mission. I don't think there's anyone who could go into this mission without expecting to see their old buddy, but in this situation, there's only one way you can meet him. The liftoff is tempered by a light rain, not the first or the last use of pathetic phallus. First and foremost, there's this nightmare of an Ace Squadron fight. Once again, a style variation that'll be reflected in the cutscenes, but all variations fly in 8-plane formation against your 2-plane formation, and PJ rarely does much shooting as much as he tries to argue with the enemy. The planes swarm you and do their best to keep you at the center mass, where you're most vulnerable. The fight can be a bitch if you're going at it like any other. The enemy plane's forward-swept wing suggests high maneuverability, and they have a speed that far exceeds most anything that you'll have earned to fly at this point, at least on your first playthrough. If you so choose to take an F-15 into this mission like some kind of idiot, there'll be a need to think on your feet. When you chase one of them, they try to lead you into the furball. But there's a shark tactic you can use in this situation. If you stay close to the floor, there's only so many points of attack that they can get you from. Contact with the ground is death, which should be avoided. You can kind of fish them down toward you and pick some easy prey when they get curious enough to see what's down there. A very defensive play is what I recommend, but the beauty of such an open system of gameplay is that many tactics are likely viable. Ace Combat Zero's AI for these fights has been incredible, mostly because of how well-crafted they are. They use real-life tactics and theoretical tactics to provide constant challenge to the player who must either force their way through or figure out how to counteract. 
To complete a previous thought, perhaps this is truly the reason why there's not a tutorial in tactics in these games. Mission 17, Avalon Dam. The approach to Avalon Dam is a dire affair, but this time there's some purpose behind it. There's a momentum driving you forward in the music and in the scenario. Friendlies are offering to escort you before being shot down immediately in front of you. Their effort is shown as more willing than anything else so far, which can only possibly drive you to want to aid the situation. The weight of everyone else's support isn't something that necessarily lifts you, it's also something that can weigh you down, as the only one who can do something about this. It's either bad luck or bad humour, but all these allied planes sent in droves seem to have call signs linked to gambling, like Domino or Joker. The amount of dead friendlies is making PJ sick. His initial introduction was to play him off as a joke character, but whilst under your wing the honesty he shows without people poking fun at him reveals that he's a genuinely caring person who doesn't comprehend the motives behind people who choose to create war. The game's gone to lengths using Pixie to express how easily someone can become jaded and angry about the state of the world. To the point where they would join a terrorist organization, so it's likely the player can completely understand what PJ cannot. The player may even have sympathies with Pixie, but PJ is a voice of someone who has hope. He despises the barren land caused by the nukes. He's scared to die. He truly believes the war should be over. And he has a girlfriend whom he loves. Though he gets little time to flesh out his character, he's more of a symbol of such naive and good things, and outside of his introductions the game tries to establish that more seriously. By placing him into a new context, under Cypher, he becomes a character worthy of liking at the very least. Once you get to the actual dam, the music picks up from the tension to a more heroic main motif, which of course means that it's time for the series staple, Tunnel Flying. There's enough targets that you need to do several passes, and on mercenary style, there's even a plane spawn within the bunker to try and challenge you. Three total targets that need to be shot five times or twice if the first hit is with something with reliable spread. As the background to this threading with the rocket-propelled needle, dependent on your ace style, a different speech will come up. Strangely, mercenary and soldier get the same one. Broadly, the plans are similar. Using V2, they will destroy all world governments, and therefore all borders. That's what V2 is for. The goal is ultimate destruction of the existing state of affairs to create a reset point. Six months may have passed since the end of the fight, but the borders are still being drawn in political conference determining the lives of many people under them. This organization thinks that even those lines will end up giving birth to new conflict, which given the games this is prequel to, is unfortunately evidenced as true, though his point was that the existence of borders makes conflict inevitable. From the ashes, a single world order will be born. That is their belief the absolute absence of states. That's right, a genuine threat of world destruction for a delusionally righteous cause, and Cypher is the one to end it. He was asking for it. The foreshadowing here was darker than absence, and with that, PJ's dead. His roles in the Black Ops after the war up until this point are stripped from history, and the height of his career and his death were hidden from the world. And he's the only wingman in the series to have never had his personal likeness show up anywhere. Now, Pixie has killed the one last voice of hope in this game, and buried him thoroughly, just like he said would happen. Without beginning or end, the ring stretches into the infinite. These final fictional quotes have been built on top of the context of the initial two, but I struggle to get a real meaning. Perhaps the third quote is a metaphor for the finite, a bordered state, and the infinite is a world without borders, a more direct foreshadowing of this final meeting. Although, conversely, Pixie's solo wing nickname, which he got from landing a plane that had lost a wing, implies one, which is finite. Cypher is another term for zero, or a non-entity, which is infinite. And now, without beginning or end, the ring stretches into the infinite. Among the many Japanese words used for zero, a key one is maru, which is used in the same way we would use o, which literally means circle. It's referring to a mathematical ring for metaphor's sake, which has no start point or end point, something you can follow infinitely. It's also probably using a pun to note a fighting ring or a bullfighting ring. The snow that introduced the gameplay is back to close it off. The date is New Year's Eve. 
The music now brings together all those small samples I was talking about and chord progressions that the game's been pushing all along, completing the game's soundtrack with an absolute goddamn masterwork. The initial beats of the song don't sound hyped or excited, they sound dramatic, as all Spanish guitar does. After all, Pixie's your buddy, and it shouldn't be this way. Of all the terrible things to have happened during this war, this may well be the worst personal struggle for Cypher and the player. But then it breaks out into this beautiful operatic rendition of the Unsung War's lyrics, and borrowing some of its tune as well. If it weren't so invigoratingly upbeat and beautiful, it might even be described as sorrowful. No, it shouldn't be this way. But it has to be this way. Pixie rides a fresh new superjet, complete with his old custom paint job. Breaking the conventional rules of planes chasing planes, Pixie can fire off a laser in almost any direction he cares for. His plane is called the Morgan, after Morgan Le Fay or Morgan the Fairy in Arthurian legend. An important part of her character is her duality, of being both potentially good and evil, and her place in taking Arthur to Avalon. This fight takes place above Avalon Dam. Cypher is the one who took out the sword after all. Though his nickname, Solo Wing Pixie, had made sense before it suggested his flying skill, the real reason was to finally hammer home this Arthurian theme. Pixies are akin to fairies after all. The stage is set for one last glorious battle, and god damn the music's good. It breaks down from the big opera into some raw bullfighter strumming, and then out into a massive chorus in a lovely choir. It's so lovingly orchestrated. Phase 2 of his boss fight has him dropping explosives in his wake, discouraging you from giving him a direct chase. Turns out he's controlling the V2 launch himself as well. Indeed, from high up, there's no literal visual representation of borders, but the physical borders between nations may well be intangible. But as Rot1 puts it in an upcoming interview, a nation only exists once it's supported by the individuals within the nation. Belka's southern half defected very quickly toward the end of the war, for example. No, the reason borders exist is a difference of ideals between certain countries, a difference of beliefs and cultural standing. Likewise, in going rogue, Pixie's created another metaphorical border between himself and the player. Pixie once said to PJ, do you think you can end bloodshed by shedding more blood? Something he should have said to himself. The wars that sickened him so much, the mistreatment of citizens by their governments. He thought it would be better if the world were bombed to shit, but this process still necessitates him bombing the world to shit. In seeking to end war, he waged a war himself, and perhaps that's his true intention. Sage advice says that if you want to know what someone's intentions are, you can infer it from their actions. He uses the terms, starting from scratch, starting over from zero. To me, that tells me he just genuinely is sick of the world, and a world without borders is also a world where there's nothing left. Maybe that's the true relation between nothing and the infinite, and how the ring, the crater, expands into the infinite. The third and final phase, Pixie's plane is revealed to have only one weak point, the front air intake. Yes, we're taking the aesthetic of the Arthurian metaphor so far, we're going to be missile jousting with planes. There's no other way to end it. Cypher takes Solo Wing Pixie to Zero Wings, and his plane violently explodes in the air, crashing to the ground. The V-2 rocket carrying several smaller nuclear weapons explodes at high altitude, once again irradiating Belkin land. The plot is foiled, at least. The serenade isn't strictly victorious. It again borrows a recurring motif in a somber atmosphere before resolving to a victorious tone. Cypher's returning home alone, and for all he knows he just killed his old wingman. It's been consistently said through the story, but from here, Cypher more or less disappears from history. It's left to the player to interpret whether or not he continued to soar through the skies or if he retired after everything he'd seen and done. He certainly wouldn't be tight for cash, I can tell you that for sure. The story is resolved. What's left of PJ's plane can be seen in one shot, with a single set of both fresh and old flowers left by it. The monologue ruminates on whether or not it was a necessary sacrifice or not for the sake of peace. No matter what route you go down, this is one unavoidable fact. PJ will inevitably be killed. PJ himself, an innocent man trying to make a better world, and for what he represents, the sense that you can fight for something good, and something good might come of it. Although, perhaps you could say he was a martyr for that ideal. It's one of those beliefs that can live on beyond a person. The game has had an unhappy time looking to draw the line between the efficacy of killing some people to save others and between the extremes of defeating the enemy to end the war, and eliminating the enemy from existence. 
The former resulted in terrorist action, and the latter resulted in omnicide. And yet, the war was just as necessary to protect people as it was unnecessary and caused deaths. The event went exactly to plan while spiralling out of control, and barely any of it was righteous, even arguably. This frame is the final reminder that people die in war, and there's always at least one person affected. It's left to the player's interpretation as to who continue to leave flowers, be they Cypher, PJ's girlfriend, or someone else. Over the next 15 minutes there's a slew of interviews. It's perhaps not the best idea to backload them like this, especially when you can't pause them, but it's likely that there wasn't a better time for it. The story isn't over yet. The bird used as a metaphor for the pilot comes back all the way from Ace Combat 4. In 4, perhaps because the advance was from east to west, coast to coast, the characters were represented using seagulls, a coastal animal. For Zero, our interviewees are alluded to in the credits using pigeons, an urban animal. Whilst Balka isn't entirely landlocked, the story is much more urban, and all of the important events take place over land. Of the interviews, they very briefly touch on a breadth of political and philosophical topics. The best way to differentiate them is by their personal affiliation. These make up the majority of the game's 48 minutes of total cutscenes. It's been said, but they act in a way that canonizes your choice through the game as Cypher. There's a second clip of the pilot, whichever one of the three, that you took down during the first mission, describing how you're either following the Code of Knights, a mercenary, or you're a soldier. And appropriately, they have character judgments about you from that early introduction. Their impression of you is strong, and it draws out as an example of your character in the middle, and then at the end of the game. You might have started the game off as a mercenary, gone through the middle as a soldier, and ended off as a knight, and each subsequent interview will tell you of a different cipher as they met you. If the post-mission screen shows your flight course through the missions, these interviews show your moral course through the story. Not only that, they reinforce the archetypes through these characters representing the ace styles themselves. Most of them end up being knightly because they were under the Belkin National Army, under a nationalist regime. It's a shame there weren't more opportunities to see mercenaries or soldiers, but it makes sense since in the story, given Belka's role as the nationalist country with a military history, it didn't hire mercenaries. It's a brave move to go for believability in your setting at the expense of narrative opportunities. There's an example in each chase style where the interviewee will recognize in you something they see in themselves, be it chivalry, survivalism, or bastardry. I'd like to give a personal shout out to the knightly man who gave up flying to let a new generation of pilots rule the skies while he tills land. It's among the most charming of the interviews. The last visit to B7R also has interviews, and for once, these have a very varying amount of quality to them. A black insurance salesman reiterates that Cypher is scary, a gravestone gives some ominous wording. Or finally, a prisoner philosophizes that his prison's intense darkness gives the illusion of an infinite void, which is a major hint to the game's themes. These last optional interviews are intercut with the second of the Gelb interviews, and an interview with the one remaining member of Espada. One of the escorts for XB0, Espada 2 has become a dancer of some kind, likely for Menko. Depending on how you approach the fight, Espada 1 will have either died or survived the ordeal briefly before succumbing to his injuries. The way she talks about him, he was very valued to her, but he didn't seem to give her a second glance. They're among the precious few things he left behind. She even seems to know that and takes whatever she can from the situation to keep with her. The takeaway from this scene is less her personal love and more that she didn't want to fight. She was simply following someone she loved, and he was lost. And now, rather than with a partner, she dances alone. Larry Pixie Falk. Garm 2. Larry is the kind of man who would never eject from his plane, even if he had lost a wing. That's right, he would try to salvage his plane no matter what. That's why he would scream, come on, at the point where you defeat him, and not even eject as his plane exploded in mid-air. As I said before, the plane is an extension of the pilot's essence per Japanese mythology, and to destroy another's sword is to destroy their essence. To prove their beliefs wrong. Larry was so self-assured, he thought he couldn't possibly be shot down. If he could destroy the system of rule, the people would be free of borders. The world would be free of needless war. But that's not where borders lie in reality. They're just a visible manifestation. The true borders are what exist between those very people who support the existence of their country, and the existence of those borders. Larry went down in smoke and was lucky to survive, practically dragging himself to one of the seven ground zeros in the Belkin Mountains. The only way for him to learn his error was to see the world that he wanted firsthand, personally, and for those who still lived there to nurse him back to health. The world he would have created wouldn't be better at all. What Cypher did to Larry was to ground him. Instead of the world returning to Zero, it was Larry instead who returned to Zero, as he now questions himself. 
The war was caused by mistrust in others on all sides, and he considers that borders may too be because we can't trust each other. Borders are a boundary drawn with the inherent threat of violence given the circumstance they're threatened. They're generated by the perception of a threshold between people's cultures and customs, economies and beliefs. Larry's truncated argument is that perhaps we could live in harmony if we could just simply trust each other to respect those dividing lines without needing to segregate logistically. And you can see the sorrow on his face, hear it in the ADR, the disappointment in him, that he realizes it's a pipe dream. It shows growth. Larry wanted to reset the world back to zero, back to its infinite potential, to create a new story. But what ended up being reset was himself. Of all the people Cypher downed that can turn up in interviews, there are those who accept their loss, those who refuse to change their mind, but most key, there's those who begin to question themselves. And they are the only characters who show any current development through their brief screen time. In Japanese media especially, they take the metaphor of the morally righteous being victorious to a kind of romantic extreme. And here it's particularly confusing, as Cypher stands for a lot of different things. But I posit that this is the point. Cypher, or Zero, is an infinite potential, backed up by strange quotes and how your playstyle determines them. Every other character is clearly written, though you could ask if they too had a choice. In shooting others down, Cypher forces them to reconsider if they were correct, if what they were fighting for was just, including Lowry. Instead of denying that borders exist, Larry accepts them as an unfortunate reality, but he wants to understand them. He's fighting as a ground troop in the Continental War of Ace Combat 4, at the border, seeing if he can understand what exactly creates that line, and how that line moves. And if any war is arbitrary enough to look into that, perhaps this is the perfect war. Larry may be lost, he may seem in a kind of self-made limbo, but that's a good thing. He's still on a journey, he's still living his life trying to discover, rather than digging his heels in. Will he see this video? If you do meet him, give him a message for me. Yo buddy, still alive? And thanks friend, see you again. His message to Cypher is beautifully choreographed. He shows a cheeky smirk and reiterates his catchphrase like it's now unfamiliar to him, like he's emulating another version of himself that he left behind long ago. The brief glance away as he collects himself, he's likely thinking what he truly wants to say to him. And then he reveals perhaps the only honest smile he's shown all game, and maturely tells Cypher he hopes to see him again. What he did was a mistake, and the only thing that Cypher did was what a good friend would do. Imagining a Cypher who perhaps thought that he'd never see Larry again, between the betrayal, potential death. Now just knowing he's still in this world, finding himself, and that there aren't any hard feelings. Finally the two coming to an understanding despite not having seen each other in ten years. That's a motive enough. That is perhaps Cypher's key influence on this war. Not with hatred, not with antagonism, he showed people their self-righteousness may not be all too righteous. They were forced to consider the other perspective by becoming grounded. Cypher, after all, could be jokingly described as having zero wings himself with that paint job. All who face him certainly ended up without them. But symbolically, in becoming zero themselves, they also gained that potential back where they could see from the onlooker's perspective. And that itself is what the player is encouraged to do at every turn for themselves. To replay the game over from a fresh perspective, and experiment playing outside of their own style, seeing new viewpoints, and developing a deeper understanding of the story as it unfolds in-game and in interviews, from another stance. This is an exercise in empathy and self-discovery, an exercise in contrast to forcing your worldview on others. Trust is vital in a peaceful world, Larry said. It's said that Japan's economic miracle was because of their single greatest natural resource, which wasn't something underground like oil or minerals, but trust. The only way to trust someone else is to understand them, and in order to do that, you need to reground yourself. Take yourself back to zero, and use the infinite potential of your imagination to put yourself into someone else's shoes. This is the heart of Ace Combat Zero. Its political message and its emotive personal message are heavily tied, but that personal message exists beyond the political undertones to that narrative. In the same way that victory in combat is about understanding your enemy, before that, a conflict can be solved before it exists by attempting to understand each other and create trust. The real shame is that's asking a lot of people. If each of us, instead of looking to change the world, tried to understand each other and change ourselves, there may well be less needless conflict we could erode the distrust in our own individual hearts. That is where the borders between people truly lies. But that will never happen.